Dutch fellow at the University of the West of England in Bristol, and I am part of the Centre for Public Health and Wellbeing. I'm going to chair today's session, and alongside me is um, the Forum Committee team, um, and Dr Lauren McNicholas from the University of Bristol is going to be monitoring the chat box, <laughs> and um, Jen Decole Poyer from Age UK Bristol is doing the important job of operating our tech. So that's us. Um, if you have any questions for our speakers during the sessions, please do pop them in the chat and we will ask these at the end. Um, we ask that during the session, you keep your mics turned off so that everybody can get the best experience from today. Um, but you are welcome to leave your cameras on if you wish. Um, and we are recording today's session and that tends to go on our YouTube channel so that people can access yeah. it at a later date. So before um, we get into this, I just want to remind um, every, uh, everybody today that the Bristol Research Forum on Aging is a partnership between Age UK Bristol, UE Bristol and University. And we organise these events three times a year to bring you the latest research on a range of topics that previous audience members have actually su suggested. And these are related to ageing and older people's experiences. So in our previous forum, um, in September, we heard from three interesting speakers on day centre care provision. Um, and you can, again, you can find this on our YouTube channel and Jen will pop the link to this in the chat if you wanted to revisit that session. Today, we are going to hear about two projects on the topic of arts and creativity as we age. There is lots of exciting work going on in this space, and so we do actually plan to do a part two and we'll visit this topic again in the future. Um, but today we're going to hear from two researchers from the University of Bristol. So our first speaker is Helen. Helen Manchester is a professor of participatory socio-digital futures. Helen will be talking about the Connecting Through Culture as We Age study, a three-year UKRI Healthy Aging Challenge funded project exploring how and why we take part in arts and creativity as we age. The, pro the project focused on how participation in all forms of art and culture, particularly those of access digitally, can influence our well-being and feelings of social connection as we age. So I'll now hand over to Helen to hear more about this work. Thanks very much, Emily, and to the whole committee for inviting me to speak today. Just sharing my screen. Um, is that working, everyone? Can you see purpley pinky things? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So um, today I want to take you on a little bit of a journey with me to tell you the story of the project Connecting Through Culture as We Age, which has just finished. Um, it's been running here in Bristol for the last three years. So I'm going to do that through moving through three, five chapters. Um, so exploring the everyday, sharing life experience, playing with design, creating together and building prototypes. So it's gonna be a bit of a whistle -top stop tour through um, a three year project. So bear with me and please do um, ask questions at the end because Obviously, there's lots that I'm not able to say, to say today as well. So the prologue. This project set out to explore how and why we take part in arts and culture as we get older, as um, Emily suggested. And our aim was to improve the quality of life of older adults, particularly those that were disabled, racially or socioeconomically minoritized. So over three years, we worked with 20 co-researchers or co-designers um, who were disabled, racially or socioeconomically minoritized with a range of creative and project partners to co-design new arts and cultural experiences to support well-being and social connection in later life. So our interest here was really in disrupting many of the stereotypes and imaginaries of older adults, particularly in relation to the, the design of technologies um, for older adults. So 
The ageist ideas that work in this space often present older adults as frail, in need of care, as digitally illiterate, or as a burden on society. So we worked alongside next generation older adults, so 60 to 75 year olds, to attempt to challenge these ageist assumptions and start to build different ideas about the relationship between culture, digital technologies, design and ageing. So what we were trying to do with this work was to look for and also to amplify the joy, the beauty, the passions, the knowledge and expertise of the older adults that we are working alongside. I guess it's important to also say that at the same time, we were also important questions that we needed to ask around inequalities in participation in arts and culture, sometimes because of the narrow ways that culture and arts are understood, um, sometimes because venues are inaccessible or unwelcoming, and sometimes, frankly, because of the lack of resources in the arts and cultural sector. So through our work with the minoritized older adults we worked with, we explored how experiences of age are tied up with questions of injustices related to race, class, gender, disability, and sexualities as experienced across the life course. It's important to say that this was a project with multiple characters involved. Uh, firstly, the extraordinary group of 20 older adults who brought a really wide range of literacies, of languages, of creative interests and expertise to the project. And I think several of them are here in the audience today. So hopefully they might not mind an answering your questions if you have any at the end. Um, we also worked with a very wide range of organisations from the community and voluntary sector, from the charity sector, and from arts and cultural and creative technology sectors as well. So our first chapter is about exploring the everyday, and this is where we started on the project. So we worked closely with um, community sector partners to recruit co-researchers, and then we worked with them one-to-one -one we used um, ethnographic and creative participatory methods to explore and understand their everyday experiences of aging related to connection, to culture, to creativity, to digital technologies, and to how all those things came together in their lives. We were also interested in how their experiences might have been shaped by structural inequalities in society too. So when we worked with them in their homes and neighborhoods, we gave each co-researcher an album, which they were asked to fill out in any way they wanted to, to try and express their passions, their worries, the forms of connection that mattered to them. We also asked them to complete a diary activity. Now, not all the co-researchers wanted to do all of these activities and we really tailored our approach to each individual co-researcher. For example, working with visual methods to accommodate people's different literacies, for example. What we were trying to do here, though, is that's really important to say, I think, is that we were trying to ground the co-design of the technologies in the everyday lives and expertise of the older adults we were working alongside, rather than beginning with the expertise of designers and their perceived needs of older adults. So this slide shows some of the different responses that um, through the um, album activity. I'm going to move on to talk about one of the co-researchers response. And I think Jeannie is actually here today in the audience. So you might be able to ask her more about this. Um, this was the first of Jeannie's poem, many poems that she shared with me over the three years of the project. Um, Jeannie has described herself to us as a woman in her 70s with Indian heritage who is curious, creative and contemplative. Jeannie lives on her own in a single, well, actually she lives with her cat in a single story purpose built social housing block. And like several of the co-researchers involved in the project, she has significant health issues which make it challenging for her to leave her home. So her poem, which I hope you can all read as I talk, describes her embodied in material experiences of getting older and being disabled. Her diaries that she shared with us, however, demonstrated her ability to lead a very rich life by engaging in depth with her immediate surroundings, 
for example, you can see in the image here, she engages with the um, hedge at the back of her garden and how it changes or almost in the moment or over the seasons as well. And through this, uh, we got to really understand about her deep sensory encounters with the intimate world around her and how she can live a, a very full life, even in a very small, restricted physical space. I think it's important to say that co-researchers' homes were not always inspiring sites for creativity and design. For example, Jeannie herself describes one of the best things about her current home being that she has her own front door, um, telling us that the privacy and quietness that this affords her is not something she's experienced in other social housing she's lived in. So during this first period of the project, we worked to build relationships and trust um, also considering how our own positions related to race, age, gender, class, sexuality influence the research, as well as really taking seriously the um, historically extractive practices of university and research um, and how that works as well. So the second thing I want to talk to you a little bit about today is uh, sharing life experiences. So one of our researchers on the project, luckily for us, was a filmmaker. And she, uh, a, a couple of co-researchers approached her and asked if they could make films with her. In the end, many co-researchers wanted films to be made. Uh, these were very DIY, low resource, participatory filmmaking, just using a mobile phone. And the brief to co-researchers was very simple. What do you want to say to the world? Many different films were produced through this. Many of them were about increasing visibility. They were about uh, sharing life experiences. They were about challenging assumptions of who might be creative as well. And they involved animations, um, ideas of future worlds and aging well, um, and engaging with their own cultures and creativity as well. I haven't got time to play many of the films but you can find them all on our website there and um, I think for those of you who are practitioners working in the age sector they can be really useful for um, challenging ageism and putting them in front of people. The film I would like to show you today is a video from one of our co-researchers called Carmen. Um, I hope the sound is going to work but please someone shout if it's not. So here we go. That's the one I go in, in town. My oh. My tomorrow must be greater than today. Cannot reach to you. His eyes in the blind. He cannot see your teeth. His ears are not day that he cannot hear the cry. Your tomorrow must be greater than today. Your tomorrow must be greater. Don't about the rest of you, but I can't stop dancing when I hear that, uh, when I sit, play that video. So um, that's just one example. Please do have another look at um, on the website for other examples. So what did we do after that? So 
the next part of the project was really about playing with design. It was about exploring, learning about, and of course, building relationships along the way in, in doing this play with design. So because we wanted to break from those mainstream design approaches that tended to start from deficit views of older adults, uh, we wanted to position design as being a response to co-researchers' interests, to their desires, their passions as exp and experiences as defined by them. So we started off working in community spaces familiar to co-researchers. We held a lot of workshops focused on co-researchers' interests and creative passions, poetry, fabric, collage and oral histories. Um, some of these were led by the co-researchers themselves and two of them are in the room today, I believe. Following this, we worked with Novice Media Centre, who are a charity that supports social action, technology, community arts and education. And with them, we designed a set of four hybrid workshops to, to give an opportunity to learn about and play with the design process and to try out digital cultural experiences. So we deliberately located this first work where we brought co-researchers together in community hubs and maker spaces that were familiar to co-researchers. And we thought, found that this encouraged co-researchers to bring in the materialities, the objects and experiences from their lives and from their neighborhoods. We found through this work that it was really important to think about how we were designing the spaces that we had to be very attentive and responsive in the moment to the little arrangements that enable co-researchers to participate. This included soft beginnings and endings, and also um, mechanisms like agreeing a contract of care right at the beginning of the workshops. So the workshops follow design justice approaches, which aim to center the situated knowledges and lived experiences of co-researchers and to ground the design processes in their life worlds. Uh, they did this by drawing on established community design practices and infrastructures. So using, for example, journey mapping activities, um, thinking beyond access needs to help uh, really understand the nuanced information about what people need to participate fully in a design process, including the importance of trust. After this, in chapter four, we want to talk about creating together. So we, at this point in the project, recruited 24 artists and creative technologists to join the co-design process with our co-researchers. So they became 44 co-designers together with very diverse experiences and expertise. And they came together for three hybrid workshops at um, the Watershed in Bristol. Um, so a very different space to the spaces we've been work working in so far. So these workshops were intended to help people to generate ideas that they could form teams around to develop prototype team projects that were then funded by the project. It's really important to say that when we wrote the bid, part of the focus was really about bringing the voices and lives of older adults into these mainstream digital innovation spaces that are often not set up with them in mind. So we tried to make this transition to this very new space a little bit easier by designing kind of a co-researcher booklet, kind of transitional objects to introduce the co-researchers to the co-designers. And we did videos of the co-designers to introduce them to the co-researchers. I think it's important to say that we probably underestimated what I'm calling the cultural geographies of the city, where this unfamiliarity with the space and also the logics and approaches used to design in these spaces was often in tension with the co-researchers and the way that they, uh, they, they thought about design and how they use design in their lives. And you can see this in the quote here from one of the co-researchers. And the last chapter, well, almost last chapter is building the prototypes. So we funded six prototype projects and I don't have time to tell you about all of these projects today, but again, please do look at our website and have a look if any of these titles sound interesting or intriguing. Um, I think all of them are interesting and intriguing, but I am biased. Um, 
I think what it's important to say the prototypes were not what we imagined at the beginning. They were very process orientated. So most of them involved a lot of workshops alongside older adults. Many of them were based on exploring and sharing stories and making stories visible and tangible in the world. Many of them involve different kinds of relations, bringing different kinds of people together across generations and across divides to discuss and make things together. Uh, many of them used everyday technologies rather than designing new ones. And many of them involved sen sensory uh, experiences of some kind. So very much not one dimensional digital experiences. So I just want to finish today by um, talking about something that we've been trying to theorize a little bit, um, which we're calling careful co-design. And we have three threads of careful co-design that I just want to briefly introduce to you to finish off. So the first is around what, what we think is important in constructing careful co-design is to design in the thick present. So this is an expanded timescale. It comes from Donna Haraway's work, if anyone is interested, that recognizes how power and struggles are entangled with design sites, practices, and relationships. And that we need to take account of struggles and transformations that have happened to people across the life course and through time. And that this is really important because we need to engage with and not wipe out what's come before or what might come after. So design here involves inheriting, remembering, repairing, and nurturing what still might be. And we draw heavily here also on re relational care scholarship in terms of acknowledging, tracing, and potentially offering reparations for histories of neoliberalism, globalization, racism, violence, and inequalities. And that's really important in our work with minoritized older adults. We also think it's, and I've said this a lot during this presentation, it's vital to ground design in older adults more than human everyday lives. So design methods that invite engagement with bodies and everyday objects, places, and spaces. We want to privilege the knowledge and expertise of those who in fact are often considered less than human when we think about that, that we want to engage with and amplify their situated knowledges and their voices and expertise. And as Rodi, Rosie Bradotti uh, discusses, to recognize the cartographies of multiple webs of power and relational connections that structure design and in fact, other kinds of practice and practice as well. The last one is design as an emergent practice that involves careful rearrangements. So this is about staying alive and being alive to what's happening as you're working together. And I really like this quote about the shared work of care as well. Um, that we need to keep keep testing, keep exploring, keep touching, keep adjusting as we go through a process. And that through this, we can cultivate a collective attentiveness and responsiveness to people's experiences and the lives that they live, live together. So just to conclude, um, feminist and post-human affirmative care ethics are at the center of this kind of design work. And we think that what we, we're trying to do, and we don't say that we always get this right, is to do justice-led co-design. And that often means that we need to slow down the pace of design. We need to stay alive to what's happening and what has happened in the past, to acknowledge the liveliness of the world and the, how the world is always changing and becoming, to draw out these cartographies of past injustices and webs of power in our encounters, and to center the voices, cultures, and bodies that have historically not been made visible. And uh, part of the feminist project here as well is that we're attempting to build contact zones with other ways of knowing, doing, and being across difference. So I finished, I hope I didn't go too long and please, please do get in touch. We're looking uh, for people who might be interested in thinking about the impact of this work. So get in touch with me or follow us. Definitely go to our website. Thank you, Emily. Well, thank you, Helen. That's been really interesting. Um, Joe's doing the virtual clap. I don't know how to do that on Zoom. So I'll <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's really, really, really cool. And you've done 
I think you've just done so much in those three years. Did you feel like it just flew by or? Yes, definitely. I wish it was still going on too. <laughs> <laughs> and it is. There are many tendrils going in many different directions, that's, I hope. Still. And I suppose that's the thing of co-design, isn't it? Once you get going and co-research is that things can sort of generate out of that. So that's yeah, great. I think so. Many, many different legacies, I hope. And Great. some of them, are, some people are here in the room. I, I'm sure if people want to talk, ask questions later, they'd be happy to yeah. answer. Great, thank you. Thanks, Great. Fanny. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so if you do have any questions that you want to ask um, Helen or the co-researchers that are on the call today, then please do pop your ideas and thoughts in, in the chat. Um, so we'll move on now to Joe. Um, and Joe is our next presenter. He's a lecturer at the University of Bristol. And Joe's talk is going to focus on another co-production research project um, in which photography was um, used both as a means of collecting data on life after a dementia diagnosis and as a soft intervention. So Joe will reflect on the added value that working with researchers living with dementia brought to the project and the benefits of using photography, both as a research method and a possible way to support people post-diagnosis. So I'll hand over now to Joe to tell us more about this work. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Emily. Uh, okay, can everyone uh, see the screen I am sharing? Great, I'm seeing some thumbs up. Yeah. Um, so today I'm going to just reflect, if that's okay, um, on a project that we did a couple of years ago and the, some of the things that have kind of sat with me since and that I've been kind of thinking about ever since we finished the project. Um, so of course you can see that it was a project which used photography um, with people living with dementia um, and it was co-produced um, by uh, the people that you can see on the screen there from left to right, Harry Davis, Roy James and Sandy Reid. And I'll talk a little bit more about their involvement. So uh, Sandy, Harry and Roy call themselves the Forget-Me-Not group. Um, and they're a group of researchers living with dementia who got involved with the study um, through a kind of, well, they got involved through a previous research project. But as that project went on, they kept coming up with lots and lots of different research ideas themselves. And as the project was coming to an end, it seemed like a huge shame that we shouldn't get to explore more of their research interests and the things that they wanted to do in research and the difference that they wanted to make in practice as well. And their research uh, interests were, were very varied actually, but they were particularly keen to know more about what happens to people in the first few years after they receive a dementia diagnosis. And of course, this was born out of their own personal experience, um, but also they wanted to know if things had changed much um, since they got diagnosed, because at the point that the project took place, they had all received a dementia diagnosis around kind of nine to 10 years ago. So they had their diagnosis quite a long time. Um, but they were concerned that traditional research methods, I suppose, like interviews or focus groups might put people on the spot and they didn't want it to be about, you know, they, they didn't want it to be about the, the researcher's perspective or, you know, re-establish re power dynamics. They wanted it to come, uh, the, the information to come from participants themselves and they wanted to make sure that it was a research project that was based on the, the participants' agenda, what they wanted to share. But also they were really keen for participants who took part in this, that they got something out of the research project other than just taking part. So they felt that a desire, you know, that if participants could learn something new um, and get some value from taking part in the research experience, that should be prioritized. They were also really keen from their own experience that there should be a peer support aspect to this research. They themselves had found after diagnosis that peer support was one of the most valuable resources that they that they got post diagnosis. So they wanted to make sure that it wasn't kind of individual interviews, that people had a chance to share their experiences together. And 
they hit upon the idea of using photography as a way to collect the data with our participants. And the reason that this was chosen was because of Harry's own experience after he received a diagnosis of dementia. He took up photography and he found it an incredibly empowering and kind of grounding way to spend his time. Uh, the way he described it was, you know, when you're taking a photograph, you are inherently in that moment. You're not thinking about the past or the future. It's a, for him, it was a kind of mindfulness, I suppose. It was about being in the here and now. But it also fitted with their desire to give something back to participants. Um, they were really keen that <clears throat> the people who took part had a had a chance um, and a reason, I suppose, to leave the house. They themselves had found that when they got diagnosed, um, they they kind of experienced a period of low mood and a lack of desire to to go out and to learn new things. So they wanted to this to be a kind of soft intervention, which offered participants a reason and an opportunity to do something new um, in an activity that took them into places that they might not have ordin ordinarily have gone. We all decided that we wanted to use, in quotes, proper cameras, um, because lots of uh, other photo voice studies gave participants or traditionally give participants kind of disposable cameras. And what they wanted to do was to give people the opportunity to, to learn something new and to express themselves. They wanted to position the study as um, giving people the opportunity to kind of master a piece of equipment if they wanted to. So the, the, the cameras that we used had multiple functions. You could kind of click them onto, uh, you know, onto an automatic mode, but you could click it onto manual mode if you wanted to and play around, try different things. Um, and so a large part of our budget <laughs> went on buying uh, the cameras themselves um, and on hiring a, prof a professional photographer to teach, um, to give a, a photography lesson to the people who took part. Um, and in that lesson, the photography teacher talked about things like framing, uses of light, composition, elements that kind of make up photography. And they were really keen to emphasize creativity and expression, not just documenting life. So the aims of the project were to examine the experiences of post-diagnosis support within two years of diagnosis and to explore how peer support might help people with dementia post-diagnosis and to explore if photography can support people living with dementia post-diagnosis. So the way that we position this study um, at the request of the researchers living with dementia was that photography was emphasised. So when we were recruiting people, we asked if they would like to learn photography skills and if they were interested in dementia research. But the, the actual kind of photography itself, the, that element of it was a, a hugely important part of the project, not just to get people to collect data, but to offer something back. That was why we partnered with the Royal Photography Society. So we actually held um, some of the meetings there um, we uh, we had time to walk around the exhibitions and talk about the composition of the pictures and to to ask people about what they what they thought about the uh, the exhibitions and the individual photos there. So the project structure was such that uh, myself and Jemima Dooley went initially to meet potential participants and talk about what would be involved. Then on the first day, based at the Royal Photography Society. Uh, we gave an introduction, um, a photography lesson and a photography exhibition tour. And the forget-me-nots came up with instructions for participants and they were an incredibly open brief. Um, it was something that I was a little bit concerned about, um, but they were really keen that it wasn't too kind of dictatorial or too prescriptive for participants. So they said, we want you to decide what to take photos of. We're interested in anything that tells us about your everyday life and how you're feeling. What makes you happy or sad? What helps or is a hindrance in your daily life? It could be something that represents how you feel. The photos should be meaningful to, to you, but they don't have to be works of art. So that was their essential brief for the people who took part. Um, 
And after that, we gave all participants uh, the cameras to take home for about two months. And we checked in on them halfway through to see how they were doing. And uh, we also were kind of available to troubleshoot any issues with technology. In the event, there weren't any, but um, we, you know, made ourselves available if they, if they needed us. So the way that we analysed the photos essentially was to reflect the meaning of the photographs rather than just their content. And we, this analysis itself began in the focus group from participants themselves drawing links between the photos, the things that they saw as um, emerging themes, um, the overlaps and the, the similarities in the, in the kind of essence of the photographs, what they were aiming for. Then we all met together as a research team to further refine those categories that the participants themselves had identified into broader themes. And we did this in a very kind of DIY, all the photos are printed out. Um, you know, we were sorting them together uh, on, on tabletops and pinning them to walls and things like that. And in the final stage, uh, myself and Jemima uh, met to scrutinize the transcripts and go over um, the actual, you know, go back over the words that the participants used to describe the, uh, the photographs so that the themes were established uh, alongside the themes established in the previous stage. I should say when we all met, we also watched back through videos of the uh, of the focus group itself. And I think this is the most interesting bit. So this is the bit that I want to focus on. Um, participants took photos of things that were meaningful for them and we we kind of uh, organized them into the following themes. So the first one was it's somewhat of a role reversal now, contrasting past and present. Lots of the participants took photos that represented the difference between their pre-diagnosis life and where they were at now. So, for example, Miranda took a photo of this bus and, set, uh, and the meaning behind that was that this bus was a bus that took her to where she used to live, a place that was incredibly important to her, where she had the happiest years of her life, but which she no longer lived. And that bus was a lifeline to her now. She could go from her home and she knew the bus route, she could get on that bus and she could be back in a place where she felt happy, comfortable, and where people still knew her um, from her decades of living there. And she said, the kids say to me, where are you going? And I say, I'm going to the place she used to live. I wouldn't wanna have anyone with me because I just get off the bus and go to all the places I know and they say, hi Miranda, how are you? And to me, I'm home. There were very few places that Miranda could go with confidence now, but she actually used the camera um, to detail her route to and from the bus station. Um, so she took hundreds of photographs that she continued to use as a kind of photographic map for her so that she could keep going to this place that was incredibly meaningful and important. Other participants, for example, took photographs of a, a hospital entrance. Um, the hospital entrance now was the place that uh, the participant went for checkups and um, healthcare consultations about his dementia, but in the past, he'd been a nurse in that same hospital. So for him, it was about kind of who he was and who he is and how those, how those things kind of fit together in the present. Lots of the photographs that people took were around the things that brought them support and joy. And a large amount of those were actually dogs. Um, a lot of the participants had got dogs after their diagnosis. Um, and one of the things that people found particularly important about their pets, particularly, was the fact that there was something, another member of the family who needed them, but who didn't judge them, who didn't treat them differently, um, who still, you know, still gave them a reason and demanded they they get up and go and do things with them, but it was always done without judgment, without a change in behavior because of their diagnosis. So Florence reflected on this, I think really beautifully. Particularly when I had my first stroke, everyone does everything for you, but I think people can sort of kill you with kindness sometimes. And my dog demands, well, doesn't demand, but you know, he needs a walk. And when I have to do something, I can do it. One of the most common themes was taking photographs which represented emotional states 
that, that are kind of related to dealing with the dementia diagnosis itself. So there were lots of symbolic photographs. This one um, taken by Carl is, uh, is of a kind of dark passageway into the woods. And he said, the whole point of this was where we are at, at the moment, we're on the grass, we're here and now, and I can see where I'm at. The way forward is some trepidation, but also maybe something magical, like the white lion, the witch in the wardrobe at the end of it. Nobody knows. I have no idea where that path is going to take me. So this was th this particular theme was something that I suppose quite surprised us. Um, people often took photographs as a, as a way of expressing how they were feeling, how they were dealing with their diagnosis. And they shared these in a way which was profoundly beautiful, but also really open um, and honest in you know, quite a candid way that I don't think we were quite expecting. And one of the things, and now obviously these photographs have been chosen before the focus group, but I think one of the huge benefits of many of a co-produced research design like this was that the forget-me-nots themselves um, in the focus group were, were sharing their own experiences. So it wasn't all one way. They were leading the focus group, but they were also talking about how particular photographs resonated with them, what they meant to them, and you know how they made them think of their own lives and their own experiences. So that's not something that I or um, my other academic colleague Jemima could do, but by offering up their own experiences, I think it really enriched and helped people to share their own experiences. Another example of this is by Florence, who took a photo in the darkness um, in an old cobbled street in Bristol, looking into the light of the city with new buildings. And she said, I'm standing on the hill. I'm surrounded by these dark branches. I know there's light out there and there's hope somewhere, no matter how black you might be feeling. It's very hard when you're encased in feelings of depressed or low, I would say. It's hard to see beyond that. So Florence also was contrasting, uh, you know, her old life, the old streets, um, the cobbles with the light at the end of the tunnel, the new buildings, but used it as a way to talk about the difficulty of that path that she was on. Another extremely common theme in the photos was taking pleasure and reassurance from the outside world. And the way that participants described this um, was that there was some kind of sense of stability and reassurance in the rhythms of nature, the way things will come round again. Um, so this example is uh, from Lou, who took a picture of a rose, and he said, it, it's the sheer beauty of it. You don't realise it, but it's always there. It never changes. If you go out and see a rose, it's always a rose. It's stability. And lots of participants took kind of similar photos. There was, um, Miranda took a photo of a robin um, and talked about how important it was for her to see this robin, uh, robin coming back each year to perch at the end of her garden on her fence and being, being able to kind of recognize this cycl uh, cyclical um, natural event um, the robin being a sense of stability in her life. And once everything had been disrupted in some sense, post-diagnosis, there were some things that didn't change that they could rely on. And nature in the natural world uh, was a huge part of that. One of the things that I think surprised us most was that lots of the participants took um, photos that represented how they saw the world, their thought processes, um, so, for example, uh, one participant took a photo of a plant um, behind uh, a window pane, which had rain uh, dripping down it. And the focus was on the raindrops, not on the plant. But the plant was clearly, the uh, you know, taking up the whole frame in the picture. And that to him was representing his uh, the way he saw the world uh, living with dementia, that there was a, a gauze, I think, as he put it, in front of his his vision, so he could still he could still access those parts of his mind, but they were slightly more blurry than they used to be. And there was just sometimes he felt like there was just something in the way. Another photo that Jack took um, was of these beautiful lights that are kind of diffused, um, becoming more blurry as they go out. And he said, the dots that you've got in the back there, that's the initial memory. So that's your childhood, if you like, where it's all quite clear. 
And as you're getting through your life, it becomes more blurry. So I just wanted to take some time to, to reflect on what we what we found in this project, but I suppose what the benefit of this was, um, if any, to the participants. So we we followed up with participants um, about two months later to ask them how they'd found things. And this wasn't part of our original study, but I kept in touch with people afterwards and just asked, you know, how they were doing and how things were getting on. And I was really surprised to hear about how much taking part in this had impacted them personally. So we added a bit onto the study to, to record those reflections. So one of the things that people talked about was that photography was a, a, an excellent way of understanding and accessing shared experiences in, in a way that kind of everyday conversations might not bring up. Um, so he, uh, Carl said, it's an experience that we all thought we were suffering by ourselves. I suppose, whereas the group and the photographs help bring us all together, and we realize we have a commonality. And that was so evident, even in the fact that participants themselves started drawing links between the photos and saying these photos fit together um, as a particular theme and these ones seem to form their own separate theme. So they, they were recognizing in the, in the focus group themselves uh, exactly how much they had in common and how much those linked together. They all really valued the, the possibility of expressing themselves and how they were feeling through photography. So Jack said, you can say, oh, I'm depressed today, or I felt a bit gray, or I'm a bit low down at the moment. But if you show them, people, family, a photo and say, that's how I feel. A picture says a thousand words, doesn't it? And it's very, very true. In fact, it's even more true possibly to the people that are starting to lose their memories. All participants um, reported that they had found a huge amount of emotional and psychological benefits of using photography to discuss their experiences. So Jack said, I think it's not what I got out of the project necessarily, but it was what I was able to leave behind in it, which was a lot of anxiety. Florence said, even though the world has become smaller now, taking part in this group opened it up. Actually something creative and making you think about how feelings can be reflected in conversation even in the photographs, obviously, which was the main thing. She also said, it gave me an excuse to express myself. It was a way of opening up about it. So all participants spoke of the benefit of learning a new skill as well, with many of them continuing to engage in photography after the project finished. So Carl said, before I just took a photo, whereas now I think about it a bit, I would say we've never gone backwards, have we? And that process of learning a new skill and socializing with others to discuss the photographs gave a lot of people confidence to pursue social engagements and other personal projects which have been lacking since diagnosis. So Lou's wife said, since he's been here, he's changed. He wants to go to the memory club. He wouldn't go before. We bought a camera and he's using it. Next week, he's joining photography class. Before we couldn't find anything that would interest him. That was, uh, that's what this has done. You've opened up something in him. So we've got various outputs from this project. If you'd like to read about them, um, there's a paper that was published um, a couple of months ago, which is about exploring the added value of inclusive research in the research process um, and an overview of the, uh, of, of the study itself, which is everyday experiences of post-diagnosis life with dementia. Um, we also co-wrote um, an article together which went in the Royal Photography Society magazine. And the photographs themselves, we got professionally um, enlarged and framed, and they've been on kind of a touring exhibition of different hospitals um, in and around Bristol in the Southwest for about, or oh, for a couple of years now. I think they've just come down from the last one. But um, we've had lots of really wonderful feedback from people who've, um, who've looked at the exhibition and left their feedback in the kind of little boxes that you get there in the uh, in the hospital about how it's helped them understand a bit more about what post-diagnosis life is like, how people see the world. And I, I think as well to dispel some of the, the myths and stereotypes that often accompany uh, dementia. But what I wanted to leave you with um, is thoughts from our co-researchers on what photography can give to people living with dementia. Now, of course, 
it's not that when you're diagnosed, photography is going to be brilliant for everyone who has a diagnosis of dementia, but it does offer, um, I think, a way of expression, a way of um, a prompt to leave the house, um, a way to get together to share um, to share a creative outlet with other people. Um, and for some people, I think that can be a really powerful thing. So our co-researchers said, photography gave the participants an opp opportunity to branch out, to get on with their lives, help them understand more about each other and that they were different, but still the same in some ways. When I took up photography, I felt I needed to get out of the house. Photography gives you that reason to go out and do something. When you're diagnosed with dementia, you're told what you're not capable of doing. The key thing there is that there are things you can do, not endless things you can't. When I took up photography, I felt like I could do something. You can learn new skills. There's a part of your brain that's great. You can learn new things, and that's what we wanted to show people. The range of the photographs surprised us. The participants showed emotion, and they told a story, and it made them feel better because they got something out. They probably spoke about something they hadn't spoken about before in front of strangers. I think the photographs brought it out. If we'd build it as come and talk about dementia, it wouldn't have worked. It's been given the chance to think about and have something to say about it. I don't think we'd have got the same information from these people without the photographs. A picture speaks a thousand words. It's their lives, it's what they live for. The thing about dementia, once you get over the initial shock of the diagnosis, your brain works in a different way. You get to see things in a different way and a photograph is a way of recording that difference. Thanks. Stop sharing. Oh, thank you, Joe. That was so, so interesting. Again, Jen's clapping, our clap in real life. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was really, really, really interesting to hear about that. And um, I, my work is in dementia, so I'm very invested in hearing more about dementia studies, but it's lovely to be able to hear about the impacts, I think, of, of these kind of projects, because I think very often, like on the last slide, you said a lot of people kind of think that people living with dementia aren't able to do new things. And actually, this really does show, doesn't it, that people can learn new things, that they can do things that they may not have done before. And to show sort of the impact that that can have on people is just is great. So thank you. Um, let's have a look. Lauren, have we got it? I've got some questions in the chat. Yeah, well, we've got some comments as well as some questions. So um, Amanda has spoken about blip photo um, that she uses um, to uh, documenting pictures, acting like a bit of a, a photo journal, which is quite nice. And there's some links in the chat if anybody would like to have a look as well. And uh, Polly has sent a link to a TED talk, which is quite similar to what Joe was talking about um using a photography journal in dementia again the link's in the chat if anybody would like to go and watch that I think and amanda then we have i was going to say amanda's got a hand up was it amanda that put in the link did you say yeah, yeah right. so, did you want to talk more about that yeah so i've been doing um blip photo since january 2014 um and it started off as an aim that year to take one photograph every day and post it in a journal. Um, so it was founded by a guy called Joe Tree about 20 years ago. Um, it's been through various guises, um, but his remit, it, it was just his kind of a blog, basically. Um, and what's really amazing about the community is a it's like minded people, but the overwhelming kindness that there is so um, like, you know, as I, I've been through a, a rough journey and a lot of people um, knew my mum because my mum joined, um, they supported my husband when he was on there. And, and like people from New Zealand and Holland and you get gifts and cards through the post because they want to support you. So you, the way you, everybody has their own journal. Um, sometimes people write, sometimes people write a lot, sometimes people write a little bit. Um, you don't have to do it every day, but so say I was following um, one person from here, their journal, I can comment on theirs and they can reply to me, but third parties can't weigh in. So you're always wow. having that, whereas like in Facebook or Instagram, people can 
pile in um mm. but this is just an inc I, you know I, if anybody is into photography as a way of sharing um i i cannot recommend it highly enough um and i've put the journals for me mum and david in the chat um david had um he'd lost his sight he'd had a stroke and he had lewy body dementia and he used to dictate to me what to write and there's some fantastic stories in there and and the the friends that i had they just encouraged him and supported him and it was absolutely wonderful great thank oh, you, thank you. I, I, I just wanted to ask amanda that sounds wonderful mm. um is it so it's a kind of online social networking space for people who have an interest in photography it is um, yeah i mean it's and it's i you can have a, a paid account which i have which gives you some extra features but there's also a free account and this is the app on my phone mm -hmm. so those are the journals of the people that i'm following so if i go to this lady here she's in new zealand and that was her shot of the day from new zealand um she's going through a hard time at the moment but you you get all of those kind of interactions there's different challenges so on a mm. thursday you have abstract thursday you have flower friday you have silly saturday derelict sunday mono monday tiny tuesday wide wednesday so there's all there's some there's themes if you want to post them um i, I mean it, it i if you, if it, photography is your thing or journaling is your thing, I, I just can't recommend it highly enough. Great, thank you. Lovely, lovely to share resources in 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 the forum. Thank you. I have to apologise as well. I have to drop off to another meeting now, but um, I'm glad I got to the end of this presentation. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. So we then have a question for Helen from Jen and she asks, have you seen any changes in the connections between the co-researchers and the different types of culture over the three years? Yeah, thanks for that question, Jen. Um, I might actually see if, um, I don't know, Jeannie, would you like to say something about your connection to digital culture that you've uh, developed through the project? You probably have to unmute yourself to do that, but you, you sprung to mind and, Let's see if you can, we can't hear you, but it looks like you're unmuting. Hmm. Um, you could type in the chat your answer, if that would be helpful. We can't hear you. On... Yeah, that's a shame. You are unmuted. Yeah, I think just your sound's not working, Jeannie. I mean, yeah, maybe you could say something in the chat or I could also speak for you because we have heard from you about this. But um. I think for Jeannie, uh, she wasn't very digitally connected when we first met and through the project has um, now, as you can see, on Zoom and attending lots of different classes and getting into arts classes and dance classes and yoga classes that are available online. So I think that for some co-researchers, it's opened up the digital space and digital culture in different ways. Um, there's other ways that I think, um, I think the filmmaking um, that Tot, one of our researchers, has introduced into the project has been something that many co-researchers have got involved in that they weren't involved in before, that has been a real joy for some of them. And some of them are going on to do their own projects with filmmaking as well. And through the prototype projects, I think too, some co-researchers who we might never have imagined at the beginning would get into dancing or singing or theatre practice ended up getting quite involved in in those kind of cultural activities that they might not have considered getting involved in at the beginning of the project just through the subject matter or content of what they were um, doing together as a creative team in those prototype projects I guess. Right then. And now we have a, sorry, oh, sorry on, I'm going to quickly ask about what's the next, what's the, the future for the prototype project? What's happening with them? Yeah, all of them are doing different things, really. One of them has already had some further funding to right. uh, develop further through the Healthy Aging um, Catalyst 
funding and we're thinking of applying for commercialization for that project um so and then others of them are be uh people are getting arts artist residencies on the back of some of the prototype projects some of them are going to apply to the arts council to develop the work further so all of them have quite different trajectories right now I think and they're just many tendrils going off in many different directions as well I think the filmmaking itself is also got some more funding to develop that both with older people to tell their stories but also with community and voluntary sector practitioners who want to think about um, you know DIY filmmaking to express the things that they I guess the value of the um social prescribing or the different kind of courses and practices that they offer in their uh, sector as well. So there's some training going on with community and voluntary sector practitioners as well. Great. Well, that's fact, great. Fanny's got her hand up. Did you want to come in, oh. Fanny? Sorry to take over. <laughs> well, well, as one of the co-researchers, um, this very morning I've been at a film workshop at a uh, community centre working with a other over 55s making learning how to make our own short films using an iphone and next week we're going to do editing which is the bit that i'm particularly excited about so yes that's a definite positive oh it's great it's great to hear from from the horse's mouth as it were to hear what's actually <laughs> don't i mean that in the nicest possible way but <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> so yeah it's lovely to to get your reflections buddy on on, on being part of it thank you is there any anything else, Lauren? In the yeah, chat? we've got a question here for Joe asking, did all the co-researchers have a passion for photography before they started, or is that something that grew over the length of the project? Um, no, just just one of them, actually, only Harry. Um, Harry took up photography after his diagnosis and, and found it to be hugely beneficial. The other co-researchers found kind of other other ways of, of dealing with post-diagnosis life in a positive way. Um, but it was it was really Harry's experience that was was the kind of catalyst for how we were going to go about things. But where the other co-researchers added so much was in, I suppose, shaping the, the feel of the project, how the focus group was going to run, who was going to do what, that, you know, the fact that, you know, we were going that they were going to lead it and um, and share their own experiences, but also talking through you know how we get people together and how we direct conversations um, because for Sandy and Roy the big thing was the value of peer support and being there for each other and so they wanted to kind of so I suppose it was those two things that Harry's interest in photography and Sandy and Harry's kind of interest and passion for supporting other people who were newly diagnosed that kind of coalesced together really in the project but it was only Harry's kind of passion really for photography right that's really nice to introduce people to a new interest new passion that can kind of continue with them once the project is finished it's quite nice I think that people maybe weren't passionate about it beforehand but clearly from the pictures they took it seems like everybody really uh, you know got into it so it's great well some people had um, some people did have a previous interest in photography and it kind of reignited that for others um, it was a way of starting something new and for lo lots of the people um, lots of participants did carry on taking photographs afterwards but interestingly for um, some that didn't they still said that um, it inspired them to go and try other things so although photography didn't carry on one of the participants for example joined a jo joined a dance group and ended up performing at the Barbican and she said that this project was a kind of learning something new, building confidence was a kind of gateway into trying something else, another way of expressing herself. So mm -hmm. yeah, that was really important, I think. Yeah, great. And then um, following on and sorry, sorry let's just sort of respond to what Joe said there. Um, I guess when I was listening to Joe's brilliant presentation, I was thinking about all the similarities between the projects and mm -hmm. um, that sense of, um, telling stories and making everyday lives uh, visible through culture and arts really struck me across the two projects. And 
that also many very similar themes were coming up in our albums as in your uh, photography work. So that connection with the what I was calling the more than human world, the animals, nature, and the importance of that. And uh, culture and arts of being a way to express feelings and emotions, uh, almost, yeah, it easier than if you were doing a focus group or asking people questions about their everyday lives, I think, that that sense of expressing yourself in a different way came through really strongly, I think, in Joe's presentation too, as well as in her work. So yeah, I just wanted to mention that it feels really important, that visibility and the telling of stories yeah, in different ways. Yeah, I think that the, the, the thing that we didn't want to impose on people, but which they, all the participants strongly advocated for, was getting these photos together um, to do exhibitions. And they, they really wanted them to be seen because they wanted, as you said, you know, this visibility. They wanted people to understand what, you know, having a diagnosis of dementia is like, but to dispel stereotypes and myths about, you know, what it is to have dementia and to help people understand how they see the world and what their everyday lives are like. And uh, yeah, as you as you say, kind of having that visibility, making themselves seem valued and, and you know, and having that artwork valued and understood, I think was really important to the people who took part. Mm. Great, thank you. I wanted to ask, did um did the co-researchers on both projects, were they did they have any um training around sort of research and research methods for the for the project? Yeah. Helen's nodding. Did you want to well I'm nodding, on? but um I, I'm nodding because Although at the beginning we called them co-researchers, I think people really were more like co-designers. Right. So we didn't, it, in this project, I think there's someone on the call, Jenny Buck, who we did work previously together in a co-researchers programme where Jenny delivered training for uh, older people as co-researchers who then did interviews with other older adults. So very similar to what Joe was talking about with the somebody asking the question who has the lived experience, I guess, which was really positive. But on this project, it was much more about, um, I guess the training that we did do was more about digital design processes because that was what we were asking co-researchers to get involved in. So that hence them really should be called co-designers probably um, because what we were helping them to understand was the digital design innovation process and how they could be involved in that process. So those workshops in the community maker space at the factory, the Norwest Media Centre were where some of that learning happened, I suppose. We did do uh, sense checking in terms of the analysis as well. So we didn't just go off and do the analysis but we did bring that back with creative yeah. methods to the co-researchers to ask them you know if we got it right in terms of our analysis of their albums and diaries for example yeah great mm -hmm. thank you oh fanny if you did you want to come in fanny yeah i just wanted to comment on the analysis because i actually as a co-researcher worked with, <laughs> with karen and tim to work out yeah. but the yeah, a methodology of assessing and then analyzing the effectiveness of the research project. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was and um, Frank and Gail were also involved in that. So, so you know, we contributed in that way as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Right. Thanks, Fanny. I'd forgotten that. <laughs> um, there's another question here for Joe. Um, so Amanda spoke earlier, just before she left, about the blip photo, and this question's asking whether the family or friends of the photographers reported any benefits in the way that Amanda indicated. They did, yeah. Um, I didn't have time to cover kind of everything in the presentation, but yes, the the family uh, of the people, the families of the people who took part, um, said it was hugely beneficial to them because it helped them. I suppose, understand what their partner was going through in a way that sometimes can be difficult to express through words, you know, both in terms of the, the things that they were finding difficult or distressing, but also the things that were really important to them. And I think that having, unlike in an interview or, or traditional focus group, deciding what you want to share with the group, you know, so at, at various stages, there are 
you know, there's agency and decision. You decide what photo you want to take and why. Then you decide from the photos you've taken exactly which ones you want to share. And in preparation for that, you decide what you want to say about the photo. And the photo was kind of, you know, displayed, uh, you know, projected on the wall. So it acted as a way to kind of scaffold the conversation um, and as a memory aid if people needed it. Um, but it also took focus away from the person talking onto the image itself, which I think was a bit less um, a bit less scary, you know, to be the focus of all the eyeballs. Instead, everyone was looking at the photograph itself. And yeah, the family members said that it, it was hugely beneficial for them in kind of understanding a bit more about how they, you know, how they were seeing the world, how things have changed for them since the diagnosis and, and how they were dealing with it. So I think, uh, I think it can work both ways, both in, in terms of people getting to express themselves, but also perhaps being better understood and connecting. Um, also, lots of the family members help people uh, go out and take photographs. So it became a joint activity, which was, uh, you know, and they started swapping the camera around and taking photos of each other and, and sharing it, you know, so it, it did become a, a shared joint activity and kind of exploration. And uh, so I, I think that was a, a really interesting but not anticipated aspect of it. Great. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from Linda, which I see, Helen, you've answered to, but I wondered if you'd be happy to talk uh, to everyone about that. So everyone... Oh, um, sorry. That that was actually comment responding to Fanny's comment before. Uh, <laughs> um, comment further up. So oh, okay. Lin Linda's asking about getting the learning out to carers and um, people living with, dement living with dementia. Yeah, that sort yeah. of, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Maybe some of, I think with this project, we've been very focused on working with the cultural and creative sectors in terms of impact rather than thinking so much about the care sector. But I think it does have important implications and, and potentially impacts for that sector and some of the prototype projects. Um, so what some of our partners are Alive Activities, who everyone probably knows, work really closely with care settings and with people with dementia. So we've been working with them uh, with many of the prototype projects to think about whether that project is something that could be an activity that was run in care settings or for older people who are living in extra care facilities. Um, so we've been doing quite a lot of piloting and testing of the prototype activity projects to see if they uh, would work in those settings. That includes two that Jeannie and um, Fanny have been involved in, uh, Expressive Pockets, which is about sewing. Um, well, I should let Fanny talk about that. And Tabletop Travels, <laughs> which is um, uh, uh, a way of journeying to another place, even when you can't uh, leave your own home. That was Jeannie's original idea. So I don't know if Annie, do you want to come in quick and say I'll something about that? Quickly about expressive pockets. The idea was a small piece of fabric that people could decorate in some way, embellish, and then could use to show the world either well, our initial idea was that it's on the tote bag, but then people put them on their T-shirts or on the hat or on an apron and, and some framed them. Um, and the, the dilemma was there were a number of participants who used to do sewing, but now had poor eyesight or arthritic hands. And so we had to develop a means of decorating that didn't really use sewing. So we used um, printing fabrics, printing pictures that they'd chosen on the fabric, um, and then vinyls that had been cut out into words and things, and those put on, and then bits glued on, and, you know, whatever, directing. And it was called Expressive Pockets. So they could express themselves. And we gave an initial theme of rebellious voices. So people could express them. And that is being looked at. It's, we've been approached by someone from the NHS and from some care homes about whether we would be able to take these. And we're, we're looking at developing it at the moment. So mm. fingers crossed. Great. Right. That's lovely to hear, isn't it? It's just, it is lovely to hear that just what sort of comes out of these of these 
projects and that like you were saying Helen how they kind of spider out and you've got so many other things going on and to hear that you know interest from NHS is just is great so thank you um Kay, Kay um mentioned the arts on zoom project um that AGK Bristol did um I thought and, and your bit at the end up Kay about um that they still choose to meet online which is really interesting isn't it I want that sort of have they ever met? Do you know if they've ever met face to face? Um, yeah, they have. So um, there might be a bit, a bit background noise here. So I'm in the office. Um, they have met, um, and we've had exhibitions of, the, of their arts a couple of times at St George's in, in Broadmead, um, in the in the centre. Um, so I don't think it's they don't want to meet in person. Although some of the people who joined that group were really quite isolated and. Um, not used to um, meeting up with others, so so they're they're happy to do that now. But I think it's something about the artistic process. They they sort of grew together through the pandemic, and it was all online on Zoom. And and it's not a barrier; it's actually part of how they create together yeah, yeah, alongside yeah. each other. Right. Really I think. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think yeah. So we did as many of our activities as possible hybrid. Uh, and I think there's so much learning to be done and to hold on to from the pandemic, actually, around the kind of stuff that Kay's talking about, that many of us have decided to return to face to face. But in doing that, we're excluding a whole load of people who, during the pandemic, suddenly a whole world opened up to them online. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in sort of rethinking the idea of hybridity, I guess, in in enabling people to access arts and culture uh, mm. in different ways and to connect with others as well because there's a whole load of people who are being completely excluded from that if we return to face to face and face to face being the only way to do things. Absolutely I um, <clears throat> did a, a separate study which is relevant here about also about post-diagnosis support and most of the people who'd been diagnosed with dementia were diagnosed during Covid and the online peer support they received, not just from, you know, their local town, but actually they were accessing all sorts of kind of online forums and peer support groups and virtual spaces across the world. And they were still using them, you know, post pandemic because they, you know, it was a way for them to make connections, you know, all the way across the world different cultures, different communities, different ways of, you know, expressing what was going on for them and also different learning points. So I think there, there were some huge benefits for, especially for people who, you know, the world had become a little smaller for some people and, you know, less able to, you know, for example, driving licenses, you know, sometimes were taken away and those kinds of things. So it, it provided, you know, a lifeline post pandemic as well. Right, Fanny, did, did you want to come in? Uh, only the, one of the early groups we set up was a poetry Zoom group at the time to Zoom. And in fact, Jeannie, who is a published poet, and another woman, a co-researcher, Karen, and I, we actually branched off and set up our own little Zoom group, which we're going to reinstate, aren't we, called Crone <laughs> Poets. So, you know, that's come out of this as well. That's great. Thank you. Um, I don't think there's any more questions in the chat. Is that right, Lauren? Have we gone through it all? Yeah, that's everything we've got in the chat at the moment. Yeah. So if anybody, has anybody got any other, anything else they'd like to to ask or say? Or Oh, Kay's asked if your um, poetry group is an open group, Fanny. Not at the moment, but we've had, we, 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 it sort of went into a bounce because one of our members, Karen, who's also a published poet, um, has been moving and she got in touch last week. So we're trying to set it up again. Um, I'm quite happy for uh, Helen to give you my email address if you'd like to get in touch. Great. Perfect. OK, well, there isn't any. Oh, yeah, there isn't anything else. I can't see any hands going up or anything going in the in the chat. Then I'm quite. Then I'm. Yeah, I think. Thank. I just want to thank um, Joe and Helen again 
for your time today and your really interesting projects. It's been lovely to hear about sort of the sort of similarities, but very different ways in, that, in which you've approached all this co-research, co-production, co-design um, with culture and uh, creativity and aging. So thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over to Jen just quickly, just so Jen can tell you about our next session, um, which is happening in June. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, as you know, we try and do three forums a year and the next one is going to be in around June. The date is yet to be confirmed. And we've got some money from the British Society of Gerontology to do an in-person event. So I'm really happy to say that the next one will be in person. And we're looking at um, with, about dates and where the venues are going to be, but it's going to be in central Bristol and everyone is invited. It will be free, of course. And we're looking at a topic of falls prevention and um, speakers to be confirmed, but we will let you know all of the information on the usual ways. Um, so if you're not on our, on our distribution list, if you want emails, please let me know and I'll be happy to add your email onto the list. And yeah, I think that's about it. We're looking forward to it. Great. Thank you, Jen. So yes, thank you again, Joe and, and Helen. And thank you, everybody, for contributing and, and coming um, and taking the time to, to listen to the presentation.